Oh, good evening. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's uh, great to see everybody. I think we can go ahead and get our, uh, our program started. It's great to see uh, a full room. And uh, I know we've got a few more people arriving, but we'd like to uh, get things started and begin this interesting discussion. So thank you all for joining us tonight for uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm Robert Johnston, and I'm the Executive Director at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs, right down the road. And our topic for this evening is to discuss opportunities and risks for indigenous communities in the North American energy transition. And for those of you who are familiar with my center, the Center on Global Energy Policy, uh, we look at the energy transition from a lot of different lenses. We look at geopolitics, finance, technology, and environmental justice. And we feel that the indigenous perspective is a very important one to include in the dialogue. We had a student round table today uh, with about 30 students from several different schools at Columbia. And I think those that were there would agree uh, that there were some great questions asked. And we also had a chance to introduce uh, the indigenous leaders from the US and Canada to a few of our faculty working on everything from the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to environmental justice uh, to sustainable finance. So we've had a good day so far. We're looking forward uh, to the rest of the evening. Now I'll say quickly that we are, uh, this event is being webcast live. So greetings to everyone who's joining uh, online. And the full vi video uh, will also be available online uh, at our Columbia website, energypolicy.columbia.edu which by the way, we just upgraded and renewed. So please check that out. So it looks really good. Uh, so you'll be able to see that video online as well. Now, for those of you who are on the Zoom line, uh, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time. and It'll be uh, delivered to us. You can do that by uh, clicking a Q&A button, uh, the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And those events, uh, our events are also closed captioned. And you can turn those captions on by clicking the live transcript button uh, at the bottom of the screen. So uh, I'm gonna remind everyone that we had some full biographical material for all of our panelists uh, out front, but to uh, briefly introduce everyone before we get started here, uh, to my immediate left, we have Neil Edwards, who's the CEO of the First Nations uh, Major Projects Coalition. Uh, and then next to him, we have uh, Chief Charlene Gale, who is the uh, chair of the First Nations Major Projects Coalition and the chief of the First Nelson Fort First Nation in British Columbia. Then we're very pleased to have David Conrad uh, in the middle there, who's the deputy director for the US Department of Energy uh, in the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs. Then we have uh, Kate Finn, uh, who's come from Colorado and is the executive director of First Peoples Worldwide at the University of Colorado. Uh, and then two more, <laughs> we have Mark Pudlosley, also from the First Nations Major Progress Coalition in Canada, and he's their chief sustainability officer. And last but by no means least, uh, Gareth Smith, who's both partner uh, and head of business and human rights practice at the law firm Foley Hogue. So uh, it's great to have everybody here. We're going to kick things off uh, by turning over to Nilo to make some opening remarks. Uh, and then he'll be followed by Chief Gale. And then we're gonna have a moderated discussion among all the panelists. So Nilo, thanks for being here and I'll pass it over to you. Well, thanks uh, RJ. And I just wanna start my remarks by recognizing that we're on the traditional territory of the Lenape people. I, I do want to give a little bit of uh, a background here to the, the genesis that, that started the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. And that genesis really centers around the need uh, for our members to make informed business decisions on major project development that may be occurring or planned for on their territories. And this informed decision making. Uh, needs to be in line with uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And, uh, and that takes capacity. And capacity is something that uh, our organization is set up to provide as a not-for-profit. Uh, we do that on a, a neutral and unbiased way. Uh, so we're project agnostic. Uh, we, we help provide business capacity uh, the normal commercial considerations that uh, you would find in, in any firm that does, say, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we provide environmental services, but we also have a public policy and convening arm to the organization as well. 
uh, our members, uh, the 130 across Canada, uh, established the organization uh, to be non-political and business focused. And when I say not for profit, I truly mean not for profit in the sense that we do not charge our members for the services. There are no membership fees and we don't take a financial interest in the projects that we are assisting our members on. Uh, so that makes us completely neutral and it, it really gives an advantage to us in terms of providing that unbiased opinion on the technical considerations that uh, our First Nations members may need to make in informing those decisions uh, based on free prior and informed consent. Uh, we are very much a grassroots organization uh, and we're pushing the envelope in terms of uh, the influence of Indigenous people at the project negotiation table, in terms of environmental and community influence, and in terms of economic influence. We have a philosophy that we focus on maximizing value as part of our, as part of our mandate. Uh, and that value can be defined in, in many different ways, uh, primarily focuses on implementing our members' vision and making sure that there's value at the community level so that at the end of the day, if a deal is to proceed based on an informed decision, that deal is reflective of community values. Part of this is also empowering the use of Indigenous knowledge at the negotiation table. And my colleague, Angel Ransom, who's sitting in the back row there, it, she leads a lot of that work for us and is a, a constant presence in our project development as well as our environmental services helping our members translate their vision into commercial terms. And, and I think our work has really uh, helped to uh, advance the quality of business deals. Uh, again, for those who have made an informed decision to pursue it, uh, along with our members' vision, it's also about de-risking the deal, not only from a community interest standpoint, but when it comes to being able to finance that deal and close it at the end of the day, uh, in the era of ESG and the incorporation of Indigenous values in the ESG standard setting, capital providers are looking for community interest to be satisfied. And so our models and delivery help satisfy that. And so I'll conclude with the so what? You know, why are we doing all of this? And why does it matter? As society advances, as we look to build infrastructure across Canada, but I think this applies in the North American concept too, here in the United States, the inclusion of indigenous values in the deal-making process become that much more important because investors want to see and communities, indigenous communities at the end of the day, want to see their values reflected back at them. Whether, it's, whether we're talking about the cost of capital, regulatory approvals, or, or ultimately achieving that community consent, it has to be values-based. And, and I'm gonna just uh, end there. I know Chief Gale is gonna share her perspective on what those values mean. Thank you. Thanks, Nilo. Chief Gale. Well, thank you. Sure more. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> I just want to make sure my mic's working. So good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and hosted by Columbia University. I also would like to recognize that we're on the traditional territory of the Lenape people. Uh, my name is Chief Charlene Gale from the Fort Nelson First Nation, but I also have the privilege of serving as the chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. And it's in that capacity that I'm speaking to you today. So I wanna thank the, opportunity, the organizers for the opportunity um, to be here. And I know that your theme is the energy transition and how it relates to indigenous people in Canada and the US. At the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, this is the major focus for us. And we're trying to get clean energy projects up and running, ones that have <clears throat> part or full participation of ownership and therefore decision-making. The coalition is made up of a roughly 127 members. We continue to grow, so I know that number's a little higher than when it was last reported to me. 
but we want to enhance the economic well-being of our members and ownership opportunities of projects that are proposed in our traditional territories of its First Nation members. So at the coalition, we're very proud to be a part of the energy transition, but in a way that is a just energy transition. For us, an, a just energy transition means supporting economic reconciliation for Indigenous people. What economic reconciliation looks like in practice is for new energy infrastructure that is built on Indigenous lands and is built not only with free prior and informed consent, but also with the financing and legal support needed to allow First Nations to take ownership positions in projects. At the coalition, we support First Nations so that they can meaningfully benefit from new infrastructure and so that we can advance Indigenous values in business. And in some cases, we're also able to accelerate how fast that infrastructure is built and comes online. Free prior and informed consent and equity ownership are all new projects on our lands, waters, is the baseline expectation of Indigenous leaders and our members. And it's true that both in the US and Canada, and certainly should be elsewhere in the world, I believe that one of the truest forms of Indigenous consent is the equity, equity partnership with Indigenous nations. So in my community, I have firsthand experience of what this looks like. In my own nation, we have for decades felt the impact of oil and gas industry without our consent. And we've seen what those impacts have been on our land. And now in the Fort Nelson First Nation, we have a generational opportunity where we're repurposing an oil, oil and gas well that has served our community for five generations into a geothermal facility. So it's 100% indigenous owned and we'll be able to sell clean energy back to the grid and also provide many other spin-off opportunities that we're finding that this project is going to be able to produce for our people in seven generations. <clears throat> the importance of these benefits to Indigenous nations cannot be overstated. We do need to be a part of our economies. And for many generations, we have seen what happens when we're not involved directly with our economies. We have been kept out of the economic deals and the benefits and the in, in, energy infrastructure and resource extraction. And as my good friend and colleague, Mike, or sorry, Mark Trahant would say, is all roads to net zero run through indigenous lands. And I would like to we'll share a little bit of that perspective with you guys today. And so thank you for having me and Masi Cho and thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Chief Gill. It's a great uh, way to start the conversation. Uh, I'd like to turn now to a little bit of the perspective here in the U.S. and open our moderated discussion with a couple of questions for uh, for David Conrad. And you know, I'll we'll have maybe 25, 30 minutes of moderated discussion. Then we'll have some time for audience questions uh, at the end. So, David, thanks again for making the trip up from Washington. Sure. Maybe to start with a little bit of background on the DOE's Office of Indian Indian Energy Policy, what you guys do, uh, mm -hmm. and then secondly. How are you seeing a transition from fossil fuels to clean energy? And is the Inflation Reduction Act providing some good support for that? So kind of a three-part question for you to kick off. <laughs> um, well, uh, the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs has a, a long history, uh, much deeper than the enactment um, of its creation in 2000, uh, to the 2005 Energy Policy Act. Um, it was a vision of the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, which was established in 1975 amongst the tribal leaders um, in the United States who had uh, energy production on their lands, um, often with varying levels of consent, um, beginning back at the beginning of the last energy revolution, uh, oil and gas. And um, so our office, although began in 2010, um, the first director was Tracy LeBeau, and she's now the CEO for the Western Area Power Administration. But she um, had some of her early training at the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, which is where I met her back in 1991, when we were both, uh, I think she was in law school and I was in graduate school. And um, so all that teaching uh, helped shape our, our outlook on uh, energy and tribal energy development. And, um, so when we're enacted and we're uh, gradually growing in budget, 
there are some uh, foundational or fundamental principles that we operate from and that we help tribes build energy projects on tribal lands. So not only is it free prior informed consent, but it's their vision that we're uh, helping them uh, achieve. And we also help provide uh, technical assistance in doing their uh, own community uh, visioning exercises for what their tribal energy sovereignty will look like as, as a, at a community scale. Um, and then we provide uh, grants and assistance, uh, technical assistance upon request, uh, no cost to the tribes um, on uh, specific project uh, uh, issues. Um, most recently, um, we've been asked to really advance or step up our game in, in consulting inside of the Department of Energy also inside of uh, US government in general on tribal energy projects. There's just, um, I believe there was, uh, we, we did an analysis and there are up to 11 different federal agencies that can participate in tribal energy project development. And um, to varying degrees, those agencies have developed expertise in those areas, but uh, as uh, most recently, it seems like everybody has been uh, turning to us for advice. And so. We're a small office of uh, 14 uh, employees. Um, a few years ago, uh, we began the office with, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, $5 million. And uh, for this fiscal year, we have $75 million. So it's grown uh, substantially. Uh, we're helping tribes with uh, projects and their energy visions. We're helping them with policy support in, in uh, the energy regulatory realm. And we're also working in workforce development and education in the energy field. And David, just as a quick follow-up, what do you see as driving that increased budget and that increased demand for your consulting expertise from the government? What, what are there more projects? Is it the policy side? Is it the market? Is it all those things? Or what's going on with that? Increased it's increased? hard to put uh, your finger on any one thing, but um, we're, we're finding, you know, in the uh, um, bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, we're, we're the Office of Indian Energy in the Department of Energy, yet there are uh, 22 new provisions specific that allow tribal participation across the department. Where that's exactly coming from, I couldn't tell you. I, you know, it's uh, the, how committees work in Congress um, and everybody um, was including tribes, I think is what uh, the bottom line was. And, uh, to our, our benefit, but it's a good problem to have, to have so much more uh, eligibility and access to resources and uh, the technical assistance can be a little bit over overwhelming at, at times. Um, and then, you know, the difference between competitive grants and formula grants and uh, all those financial mechanisms is also a challenge that Great. we have to work with. So. Great, thanks, David. Well, Kate, let me turn to you. First of all, maybe I'll, you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your work with First Peoples Worldwide in the University of Colorado, and then pick you up on this theme of, of this increased investment by the Biden administration in tribal energy, uh, their consideration of FPIC, you know, their appointment of the first uh, Native American Interior Secretary. You know, a lot of things are going well, but you know, what, what should come next? Where, where can we do even better on that front? So just tell us about yourself a bit, and then your thoughts on what the administration's doing. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. And thank you so much to the organizers for this. So uh, my name is Kate Finn. I'm the director of First Peoples Worldwide. For 30 years, our mission has been to work from a foundation of indigenous values to achieve a sustainable future for all. And I have the incredible privilege of being the third indigenous woman to lead this organization. We sit within the University of Colorado and really what brought me to the work and what drives me in the work is I am an attorney um, and I was an attorney that practiced in federal Indian law. And what I love about my practice and what I love about my job is that we get to consider everything when we're indigenous as part of a solution set. So when I look at a contract, when I look at a deal, I get to think, okay, it's, it's about economics, it's about finance, but it's also about the values. It's about the culture, it's about the place, it's about the environment, it's about the spiritual aspects of the place. It's about the people that are living there now and the people that will live there in the future. So that to me is what drives me in my practice and what drives a lot of the work that we do at First Peoples Worldwide and how we want to vision, vision forward in the green economy. 
Um, I'm also a part of an organization um, or a coalition of organizations called uh, Securing Indigenous People's Rights in the Green Economy or SURGE. And we are a collective of organizations that are doing just that, looking at how it is we can elevate Indigenous leadership in the green economy because we all came together to say, okay, this is a once in a generation opportunity for, for us to look at the economy. We know what happens, particularly in the extractive sectors. Uh, the, the playbook isn't great. Uh, tribes generally get left behind in terms of the financing and deals. Uh, they will get left with projects on their lands that they have to essentially deal with uh, without a lot of support um, and the long-term negative effects. We know that that is what can happen, but we know it can be different. So as we build into the green economy, how is it that we can elevate indigenous solutions and indigenous leadership in doing that? And I really believe that um, our solution set as, as a global community is so much better and so much fuller uh, as we approach these huge, huge issues such as climate change um, and how, how we move through a just transition. So that, that is part of where I'm coming from, what I'm doing in terms of, uh, so what we do uh, day to day is build the business case for free prior and informed consent. And as, as you've heard up here, we really are working with the private sector and working with indigenous peoples to show how expansive free prior and informed consent is. As Chief Gale said, the truest, these equitable deals, true equity is the truest form of consent. That is consent. When we are doing uh, deals that have real participation, real decision-making for the nations on whose land it rests. But free prior and informed consent is also being able to have a decision over all of your lands, territories, and resources. It's the ability of a nation, of indigenous peoples to say no and to be able to uh, hold that land for their own benefit and to be able to exercise control over their own resources. So FPIC is expansive and that is a lot of what we do and what we say. And I think um, as we move, move forward, what's really important to me um, is really in a lot of times in the media, a lot of times in the global discourse, indigenous peoples <laughs> are painted as the opposition. You know, they're opposing development. But in fact, so many of the tribal leaders I work with say point blank, we're not opposed to development. We're opposed to development without our consent. So free prior and informed consent is the North Star. Really understanding that indigenous peoples on the land have solutions, they have knowledge. They have traditional knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, they have science that can feed into these global solution sets. And really when there is opposition, it's an opportunity to pause. It's an opportunity to understand what that opposition is and why, why it's there. So that's one um, aspect that I think is really important. And I think I, um, in terms of where we are with the Biden administration and where we are in terms of the law, you know, the United States really has adopted a, a consultation regime. You know, when we signed treaties, uh, hundreds of years ago, that was a consent regime, right? Treaties, in, in large part, not always, were a consent regime. Um, but what we have now is consultation. And I, that is where the political will and the operating conditions that we have is consultation. And I think that there's a lot of benefit there. I also think that it's good to work our way back to a consent regime and to really position indigenous leadership and tribal nations uh, in a, in a place to have full decision-making power over the lands, territories, and resources. Thanks, Kate, that's great. We're, we're gonna talk a lot about FPEC and consent versus consultation here in next few minutes. Starting with you, Gare. So uh, if you read Gare's bio, you know that we're very fortunate to have him here tonight. Tremendous experience uh, on this topic, including negotiating uh, the UN uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the Clinton administration, working with Ted Kennedy on these issues on the Hill, uh, and working all over the world uh, on business and human rights issues including Indigenous peoples over the last, uh, you know, for quite a while. So I'm kind of wondering if you could take a bit of a historical perspective and how you've seen the issue of FPIC evolve from a private sector perspective. You were involved in some of the original negotiations, and now you've been working with the private sector. And how have these issues evolved since the 1990s when this first all started? Yeah, well, thanks, RJ. Yeah. I don't know if this is working, but I can talk yeah. loudly. 
Um, and thanks to, it's great to be on such a distinguished panel. It's really wonderful to hear what these folks have to say. And thanks to you all for coming out and joining us this evening. Um, my answer to your question is I'm, I'm kind of very excited because I think due to the folks you named, you know, due to the Ted Kennedys, the Bill Clintons, you know, Obama, Biden, Deb Holland, Bill Sack, you know, who, who have shown a lot of energy in trying to move the ball forward, and to some companies that have done a lot. I mean, Enbridge in its recent agreement with 23 uh, First Nations, you know, Rio Tinto uh, with, with, with the new things it's doing with the Resolution Copper Project uh, are moving the ball forward more in the last 30 years than in the previous 300. And, and, and I think probably everybody would hear, would agree on that, if only because that's such a low bar. <laughs> um, but I think, I think the easiest way to visualize this is if you think of three increasingly concentric circles. And, and in, in my experience working with indigenous folks, and I, and I represented the State Department on a nation to nation basis with, with all of the federally recognized tribes, is three things that the tribes often wanted was one, to be recognized that they have a right to self determination and sovereignty. Number two, that their cultural heritage should be respected. And number three, that the seventh generation concept to be able to live sustainably, uh, not for, for your generation and for six more to come and for seven more after that. Historically, in the United States, if we, so that's the tribal position. Now we take the next bubble, the, the US government. US government has basically honored those three things in its absence you know, for most of our history. That's changed a lot. And it's starting in 1989, when the International Labor Organization passed a convention, ILO Convention 169, and it's kind of interesting that the International Labor Organization would be the first UN body to address indigenous peoples and their rights. But that brought in the concept of consultation you know, for all the countries that agreed to that. That was superseded in 2011 by UNDRI, UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and as a subset, EFTA. Um, and we've had certainly the government of Canada, certainly the government of the United States and some other governments we could talk about, but probably those are the two we're focusing on today, taking a lot of steps to try and implement those in a meaningful fashion. And, and uh, Deb Holland, and, and I'm so glad you're here today, Dave, has done so much in that, in that respect. And she's had a lot of support from the president who at the end of his first week in office uh, took a very important step. You know, when I was in the government with, with President Clinton, all the agencies that consulted with indigenous, with the Indian nations did so on their own concept of what consent was. So they all had a different definition of consent. So you could legitimately have one organization in a two-year process with a tribe discussing the benefits, the pros, the cons of a, of a potential uh, infrastructure project, and another organization that goes and has lunch one day and go, okay, check the box, that was my consultation. And both were perfectly legal. There was no harmonization. So in his first week in office, Joe Biden said, I'm going to fix this. I want to bring all of the different agencies together. We want to have one harmonization, common standard for the U.S. government. That alone is a magnificent step forward. So that's the second layer. The third layer is businesses, private sector. Well, private sector has had no obligation to respect indigenous rights outside the law ever, <laughs> even largely today. But what changed in the last 30 years is in 2011, uh, the UN uh, Human Rights Council unanimously accepted, adopted the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And this is a new standard that came forward for companies and only companies, because UNDRIP was only for governments. Um, and, and what it did is it sought to differentiate the roles and responsibilities of governments and companies. And it said governments have a responsibility to proactively protect human rights, which means you have to have a legal system, a transparent judiciary, you know, a court system you know, that works. Companies have a responsibility to respect human rights. And at one level, the basic level, that means abiding by the laws of the country you're in. But if you're operating in a country that doesn't have basic laws protecting human rights, then you need to hold yourself to a higher standard and international normative standards. And so as part of that, the big sea change since 2011 now is companies undertaking large infrastructure projects that touch upon tribes' interests do human rights impact assessments and do a due diligence process to see what is the impact. And it may be a positive impact, it may be a negative impact, it's probably a combination. And, and then address with the tribes what those impacts are going to be, both positively and negatively. So you, know, you take those three concentric circles and we're really in a much, much better place today than we are, were in 1989. That's great, Gary. Let me ask you a follow up on that in terms of this thinking I've been doing about EFPIC 
And is, is there kind of a soft version and a hard version, right? Because when I think about FPIC, it seems like there's a lot of informing, but when it comes to the consent part, maybe it still depends on which country and which laws and so forth. Do you think that industry um, is sort of given that uncertainty, almost self-imposing like voluntary protocols that effectively yeah. are FPIC like? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of a paradox because I have to correct you on something you said, yeah. depends on the country, it doesn't depend on the country. Right. There's not a government in the world that recognizes a veto right. And, and, and that the simple reason is governments will want to be able to use eminent domain and they don't want to have to turn to their non-indigenous population and say, we're going to use eminent domain on you, but we're not going to use it on indigenous. They want to say, we do it the same for everybody, whether it's a road, a highway, a hydroelectric power plant. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. The, the paradox here is companies don't have a responsibility to receive under. They weren't there. They didn't negotiate. They would only have that responsibility if a government were to implement it into law and they had to follow the law. That said, as a very practical matter, to secure a social license to operate and have a successful business, companies are realizing that they need to have buy-in from their communities, whether they're indigenous or not. But certainly the indigenous communities, whether indigenous communities own the land and you're putting a pipeline across the reservation or whether it's traditional land where, where, they, where they have you know, spiritual ties or, or cultural ties. So what you're finding is that a lot of companies today are engaged in what used to be just a government process of consultation. They're out there, they're meeting with the tribes, they're trying to figure out what's important to them culturally, spiritually. And this, this is what Rio Tinto is doing with a resolution project in, in Arizona. They're, they're actually doing something which frankly should have been done hundred years ago. They're hiring the, the tribes that had tra traditional rights to come and find and tell them where their, where their remains, where their cultural values, where there's a spiritual thing. You'd think, I mean, this is kind of common sense. All of us in this room would have said, of course, that's the first thing I'm gonna do was never done, you know, but, but before the Resolution Copper Project. So that's showing you how far we've had to come and how much basic common sense change can promote and make lives a lot better. So, feels, yes. No, it feels like governments and industry are moving at different speeds, but Mark, let me ask you, Mark Leslie, like Gary, you have a global perspective. You've worked around the world. You've been involved in developing big capital projects, not just in the US and Canada, but all over the world. You're a dual citizen. You're first, your nation in Canada straddles the border as, as it was before uh, the uh, arrival of the Europeans. Uh, so you do have a global perspective and you have, I've talked about the differences between the US and Canada. And I'm curious what you think about this conversation of EFPIC, how it's planned in Canada, and also the idea around the equity-based partnerships that are being developed by your organization. You know, could that model work in the US as well? Well, thank you. Um, I'm a member of the Intlacatan Nation, which is Interior Salish. So we're in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia on both sides of the border. And uh, yes, in Canada, what's interesting about FPIC and the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous People, Rights of Indigenous People, it has been implemented into law in the province of British Columbia and has been a, a, is about to be implemented federally. So you start to have this drive for companies who understand to get the social license to operator, it's not just to comply with the federal jurisdiction. You're starting to see investors now asking questions around ESG standards. Have you done your due diligence? How is this affecting people on the ground? So there's a new push. It's the market that's starting to move this. So smart investment firms are looking at ESG and realizing there's an opportunity here to invest in those companies that are doing it. And if those companies are not doing it, there's also an opportunity just to change their management or do something to give them an edge to get access to the resources. So that is happening. Um, just as a side note, we did at the coalition do a report on our website on ESG and indigenous perspective. And we found that there's no indigenous values in almost, almost no indigenous involvement in any of the ESG frameworks worldwide. So it's a bit of a paper tiger. That said, investors, allies who are consumers are driving companies to make those decisions. Now in the Canada and the United States, the United States has not implemented UNDRIP the same way, but the investors are here well. So you're gonna see the large pension funds, the large investment funds starting to demand to see performance that matches world standards. So it is going to happen here and it is happening. I have, a, I have a 19 year old daughter who knows exactly where the lithium came from in her iPhone and she knows the companies have done that. So the, the, the information is circulating. So it is going to happen in the United States. It's fascinating. Governments are playing a role. Industry is playing a role. Consumers, investors. Nilo, you deal a lot with the private sector in your role. And as FNPC has gone to the market, right, with these projects from your members and talked about these um, equity-based partnerships, 
What's the feedback been like? What kind of reaction are you getting and how does the private sector view these opportunities? Well, there, there are a few examples of where this has happened, but I want to offer some comments about my, my last trip down here. Uh, myself and my colleague uh, did a circuit with uh, capital providers. And the main takeaway for us was there are not enough precedents yet of equity deals with Indigenous people across North America for the market to see it as a good credit risk. And so therefore, uh, there's a high cost of capital for our members and other Indigenous nations that go out and finance the deals without some sort of structural enhancement to the business deal, without uh, the use of, say, a, a loan guarantee. And I know there are loan guarantee programs here in the United States. We have them in Canada too, but they only exist at the provincial level uh, in Alberta, Ontario, and Saskatchewan. Um, that, that, that is an impediment. There are several reasons for it. One is an antiquated piece of colonial legislation called the Indian Act uh, that, that causes a lot of problems. Uh, there, there is uh, tied on to that, the lack of at-risk capital or like a down payment when you go for a mortgage. Uh, our members just don't have that capital to put at risk and, and therefore the market isn't satisfied uh, that uh, they can lend on commercial terms. Uh, so what, the, uh, what problem this creates is there's opportunity for equity participation that can't be realized. We're sitting on three deals right now where we've negotiated really good terms getting back to my opening comments about the community values being there reflected back in the deal. The risk has been transferred back onto the private sector to accept because our members have said, we're not taking the risk for your project that's crossing our land. So you have to accept that. And they also have said, we wanna maximize returns. So you're gonna structure a deal with us that does that over and above all the environmental considerations where our members have had direct influence. So these are good deals, but at the end of the day, can we get them across the finish line? That's yet to be proven. We've been lobbying hard at the government of Canada to play a role in this in terms of advancing economic reconciliation in Canada, in terms of operationalizing some of the articles of UNDRIP uh, and, and, and I think it's going to come to a point where, uh, particularly for the energy transition and net zero objectives in Canada and across North America, uh, you know, as, as we have said, Indigenous communities have to be a part of that if that infrastructure is going to get built. So something has to give on the issue of access to capital. David, let me ask you to follow up on that in terms of financing these projects. So there's one layer of risk around clean energy in general and another on tribal lands, right? And the kind of, how do you provide seed capital? What's the permitting and construction risk? Is, is your office or other parts of the DOE or is it LPO? How are, are you guys thinking about where the financing aspect of this, where the US government can play a role? And especially the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, um, and I will uh, quickly step off a ledge and go over my head in, Please this, do. That's in, what this, we're in this water. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, we, um, we partner with the Bureau of Indian Affairs that does feasibility assessment grants. We provide technical assistance, strategic planning and uh, grants for equipment. And they're usually for small projects. When you get into something that's bigger uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, now you have uh, the direct uh, payment in lieu of tax credits. And you can stack these things in, in, in certain ways, depending on the profile of your project. And then we also have um, newly enacted uh, uh, $20, bill, or $20 billion of uh, loan guarantees, uh, specifically for tribes. And then there are even, uh, and then direct loans, uh, $2 billion um, for tribes uh, in that. So that it, putting these things together uh, takes a little bit of skill. Uh, I don't think one has been uh, since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the expansion of the loan guarantees to 20 billion. 
there hasn't been a project that has strung all of these together yet. So we're right at the cusp. All, there are so many more tools today than there have been ever before in such larger amounts. It's um, uh, very hopeful that we're gonna reach that um, scale at some point. And the other thing about the, the loan um, program office is that, and DOE in general, is that where there are specific provisions for tribes, that's usually, um, you know, exclusive territory for tribes to participate in that. But when there are other provisions uh, that don't ex exclude tribes, DOE interprets that tribes are eligible in all those programs as well. So if it's uh, retrofitting uh, transmission lines from, from, an, from an oil pipeline to, a, you know, a carbon sequestration or some other repurposing of rights away for, for cleaner uh, climate uh, use, um, tribes are eligible to, uh, participate in that project and uh, while our funding for our grants is specifically uh, on a definition of tribal land um, the loan program office um, projects can go to uh, tribes and uh, tribal entities or tribal partnerships where there's substantial benefit demonstrated to the tribe but it doesn't necessarily have to be on tribal tribally owned land so that's another huge expansion Absolutely. of uh, the potential to participate. Projects. Well, I really like to use the phrase hope, hopeful. That's something I think that we need to hear more of. And I think at our center, we'll try to you know, build awareness of these programs in both countries and connect the dots between you know, policy and finance and environmental justice. And Chief Gale, I know you've, you think about these issues all the time. You are the chairman of the board. And uh, part of that job is to think about how this is gonna evolve with long-term and long-term strategy you hear what's happening here in the US, when you look at what's happening back in Canada, how do you think these issues are gonna evolve in the next five or 10 years for your community and, and for the for all of your, was it 130 nations that are part of your, uh, your organization? Well, thank you, that's a very good question. And I can speak from personal experience just in my own community, but I think Mark touched it and our conference last year was really putting the I in ESG, the indigenous component and how money is lent to investors and it has to really tie in with these projects being in, built on our communities where we have full participation. Um, so in Port Nelson First Nation, we have the three biggest gas basins in North America. And you can help understand how that drew so much attention to the fracking industry. We were involved in conventional drilling for over 50 years, which was going at the pace of our people to be able to practice our treaty rights. And when we signed treaty in 1910, it was a peace and sharing treaty, not a seed and surrender. So what that meant is that we welcomed the newcomers to, into our land to be able to raise their families and uh, be a part of our economies. But a lot of the treaty promises got lost along the way. So when the fracking industry came in, it exploded our territory. And if we didn't stand up as a first nation and our first nation have always, you know, put up a hard front in ensuring that our, our rights were protected. Um, it just went back to, to having to take that hard stand. Like they didn't have consent, government didn't have consent. And um, with the Blueberry River Fork case, it's really changed the dynamics, how um, industrialization will happen in our territories. And I know each region is so different. Um, the provinces, you know, treat these kind of projects so different. And right now through case law, we're able to have shared decision-making on land management and also ensuring that, you know, the economic piece will be covered too. So for an example, um, because of this work, we're seeing industry approach our nation in a different fashion, knowing that in order to be able to, to build the project, we have to come to an agreement. And through, through that process is, um, you know, investors want to build like $2 billion facilities for hydrogen in our territories. Um, you know, and they're coming with the, the concept is that we're not going to allow you to have any construction risks, but we'll go and get the investment, we'll build the project, and we're going to give you equity when we turn the key. There's other examples that are happening across Canada and the region is, um, you know, we're really pushing for um, federal loan guarantees. We know that we can't access the capital like the business community, and we can't make decisions as fast as the business community. So we have to build up the capacity within our communities. And that's why coming together as a group of First Nations to really um, look at how, how do we solve that, that challenge in our communities. And, and that's what the coalition really does for us. 
where I look at how um, the future holds and how we can move forward is going back to before first contact, before <laughs> first contact, before colonization is there's no borders. And so when you look at my people and my ancestors, we were very powerful in our economies and we, we were very nomadic people. So from you know, the Yukon all the way down to Mexico, you'll find that our trade routes were very vast and that we were very rich and very on the forefront of our economies. And with the time, you know, that changed. And I think we can get back there. So when we look at this energy transition, we don't want to have to have people that are living in poverty make the decision to compromise their environment to earn money. We got to actually look at this as a North American problem and really take down these borders for transmission lines to be built so that not only that Canadians can prosper, Americans can prosper too. And I think that um, going forward, we can really overcome those challenges because if we don't, these projects are gonna be built overseas and they're gonna be working towards de developing our resources. We're gonna continue shipping them over there when we have an actual generational opportunity to make sure that the seven generations on this continent actually prosper. So um, I might not have answered the question, but um, I just, I really think that we have to really put down these borders we have to um, really involve indigenous communities so that projects are built on time, that our culture, our language, and our identity is protected and incorporated in these projects. And when you have government and industry and indigenous people sitting at the table together, we're gonna get there faster. And the project can be built on time and the policy and regulations can be solved in a more timely manner because I see how many roadblocks happen when a community is left behind? They're saying no, because what's the benefit of a mine being built or um, you know, another project that's you know, going to bring vast opportunity? What, what's the benefit to the people to say yes? If our people are going to be left behind, there's no training and education, we have no orange source revenue, and we're continuing to live in poverty. We're obviously going to say no. So we have to really look forward to um, working together. And I think that the coalition does a really good job on bringing people together and facilitating those discussions. And I would like to uh, explore that a little bit more as we go forward in the next five years. And you will see, because we have um, $20 billion of capital projects that are working with our communities. And I see those projects being successful. Yeah, we have a lot of challenges, but we are going to get there. And I'm excited about the future. And yeah, I think that Hopefully we have I'm a lot excited. Offer. That's good. And obviously, you know, that's what the board is for, for creating a vision. And that's exactly what you did. So thank you. We're, we're pretty much almost out of time here. But Kate, I want to come back to you, uh, at least for a quick answer, before we go to the audience Q&A. Also on the vision front, right, which is really, when you hear this vision that's being built in Canada, you've been up there, you've been part of the conference, you know, what elements do you think you can bring back and others can bring back to the U.S. that, that might make sense within the sort of U.S. legal system, political system, that would help with your surge campaign in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, acknowledging that there's different operating conditions in the United States and Canada, right? So the UNDRIP is almost passed in federal law. There's um, robust case law on, on FPIC and the UNDRIP that's going on. And there also, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Call to Action 92 that really motivated and continues to motivate the private sector to find out what their indigenous rights risk, risk exposure really is and how to form partnerships. So the operating conditions are different. I think for me, what First Nations Major Project Coalition does so well is exactly what Chief Gale just said, is to show that indigenous solutions don't have borders. That in fact, First Nations, tribes, indigenous peoples, are incredibly creative and incredibly innovative. And that is the innovation we need as we move into the green economy. If you're living in a community that is at the end of the grid and your energy is the first off and the last on, you've probably come up with a solution to have energy for your people, right? You can't live in the dark for 48 hours and more and more. So these are the solutions and those solutions need to be elevated up. Um, and I think that what, FNMPC does so well is to show the partnerships and to show 
how equitable deals can be done as a playbook and as a model for indigenous nations around the world, for tribes and native nations around the world. So what I think is, is what we've seen in the US context in my experience is when there are deals, particularly when you're talking about private equity and these you know, bigger kind of equity deals, they always feel like a one-off deal. They always feel like a one-time thing. But in fact, there's momentum around doing better deals with First Nations and with Native Nations. And that is work that FN, FNMPC really does well to collect and to curate and to show uh, around. So I'm really excited to work with them to continue to do that and to show how uh, indigenuity can really filter up across all sectors. Quick addition from you, Chief Gill. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, our nation has been very fortunate to be a part of our economies. And I want that for our indigenous nations across Canada, because I've been to a lot of the villages and a lot of these communities are remote and they're living in poverty. They're living in crowded homes. They're living with, uh, like you said, burning wood, no, no power, no internet. And we got to get beyond that. We got to get to a place where they have opportunity to build their wellness centers. They have opportunities to build their, their community halls and their schools. Um, our people had a vision where education was so important. And we celebrated our 40th anniversary of Cello School, which is a private school on reserve where we, we bus non-Indigenous kids too. We have 40 kids in our high school and it starts from K3 to grade 12. And our people are able to go to school around the world. Indigenous people and people living in poverty need that opportunity too. And this is what can be done when we're all sitting at the table meaningfully and having a real discussion about breaking down these borders. Thank you so much for this fabulous discussion. We still have a few minutes left for questions. So uh, we're, let's keep the questions really short because we're limited on time, but I just want you all to hear from the group here. Uh, so let's start at the back. Just a nice short question, uh, introduce yourself. And and um, we'll go to the Zoom as well. If you have a question on Zoom, just click that Q&A button. Sorry. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a uh, second year Canadian, or first year Canadian student at SEPA. Um, thank you very much. Um, Northern Ontario is home to huge deposits of critical minerals and the Ontario government, uh, Doug Ford has expressed a very strong ambition uh, in uh, building roads and basically developing the mining industry in that region. <laughs> Uh, and the region is also, of course, home to um, First Nations, uh, which have very mixed uh, views towards uh, the current development and the approach being taken. I was wondering what uh, your take would be on an approach that upholds UNDRIP um, and respects uh, the rights of, while empowering uh, the First Nations, uh, and what an approach could be that could also lead to um, benefiting the local communities in a sustainable way with the seven generations, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you for the question. When the fracking industry came to our territory, um, it was in the core of our territory where we fish, hunt, and trap. And so when the producers came, everyone wanted their own road from Fort Nelson straight to their gas plant. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to do this in a collaborative approach. And we're going to make sure that there's, the roads are going to have less impact. So um, we'll just call the SYD road, which is a loop. And then you have to go off that wherever your project is. But what's important for the First Nations that are going to be impacted by that is to really come together on a regional scale to develop their land use plans, because you can't just stop and be like, okay, well, the project stops here and so does the river. Well, it doesn't, because the downstream effects are really important. So um, ensuring that land use plans, land management frameworks are in place, and you're, you're working with government and industry to honor those agreements but also to ensure that data collection. So you can see the cumulative impacts that it will have over time. And it's really important for First Nations to own that information so that they can track it and trust that whatever happens to the future, they can make decisions based on that. It's not just about the economics of it, but you have to balance it with the environmental approach. So um, that's something that we have learned and have collected the data over time. Um, I had the privilege of showing RJ a video, and I think that's where the power is in the community, is to be able to make that informed decision by owning that data. Let's try to do two more quick questions. Sir, at the back. My name is Christian Branion. I'm head of the Environmental Justice and Climate Just Cities Network here at the Earth Institute and also head of Climate Justice at Carbon Direct. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful and timely panel. Uh, my quick question is for you, Chief Gale, but may maybe others can chime in. 
um, you described equitable partnership and projects being done that involve indigenous ownership. What do you think of as an equitable distribution of ownership? How are you thinking about that? It all depends. Um, so if it's a project in my community, then we, we are a nation the size of Switzerland. We don't have a lot of nations that are impacting our decisions. We make decisions based on the guidance of our elders and our youth. And that's where we get our consent and our mandate to pursue these opportunities. But we also started with um, the capacity of two people in our lands department. And now we've built that up to 30 people and guardians on the land. So they also have the responsibility to ensure that we're looking after environment. And through our Daytai Corporation, which we separate the politics from the business, they have a responsibility. They can't just sideline the, the lands office. They have the responsibility to report and ensure that our values are being protected on the land while we're looking at the opportunity working with the proponents. So we're not gonna bypass our values to get the project to be built faster. Um, and then there's also the importance of the proponent and the Daytai board of directors to go in and present in front of the community and build that relationship because in our political atmosphere, we have two year elections. So what happens if you get a whole different council? Well, it's really up to the community to drive the work and give the consent and for the leadership to facilitate and negotiate those deals and bring them back to the community for their blessing. So I hope that answered your question, but or maybe you we can jump talk later. Well? Too. Jump here too. You asked the question, what equity stake or what, what is fair? Yeah. It depends on the project and the industry, but I'll give you an example that's happened in Canada recently. Ontario has a transportation, uh, electric trans transmission network company, Hydro One. They had looked at different lines, indigenous people in Ontario had wanted equity stakes in those different projects, but Ontario's Hydro One had made the decision, true partnership means 50-50. So all new transmission power lines in the province of Ontario will have a 50% equity option for First Nations. So 50% is where that's going. That's the second largest transmission company, electric transmission company in Canada. It will set a precedent but it depends on the project and not all nations want that much or may want something else. So it's up to the negotiation. Chief Gale is right. It's negotiated, but what the community values and interests are, but you wanted a number 50, which is going to be interesting because now the nations have to raise that capital, which gets us into a problem again, because we don't have, we don't own our assets. They're held in trust by the federal government for our use. That's a whole nother challenge. But that's a challenge that the coalition is working at. How do you access capital partners who can assist enforcing those indigenous values, which benefits not just indigenous people, but with the energy, trans, uh, energy transformation going on, that the power lines are going to power cities like New York. They're going to power Toronto. So it's it, all of our interests to make that happen. I hate to end this because I'm sure there's more questions and I have more. And I think we go a couple more hours, but we want to get you out here on time. So I'd love to thank all of our panelists uh, who made the trip from Canada, uh, from Boston, from DC, from Colorado. It's, it's been a fantastic discussion. Columbia will certainly be doing more work on this. Um, as mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our Center on Global Energy Policies website in a few days. And please join us for our next event, Climate Action in Nigeria, Risks, Urgencies and Opportunities, which will be held virtually Wednesday, February 15th at 12 o'clock Eastern time. So please join me in a round of applause uh, for our panel. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.